Welcome to my talk, You Can Do Better Than Standard Anodite Map, New and Recent Improvements to Hash Tables. Um, I started you off here with a graph which is just going to show like the, the amount of improvement we're going to get throughout the talk. Where we started off with a really slow table and we're going to end with a really fast table and this is just a first indicator of what we'll do, but we'll get there when we get there. Also, there'll be lots of graphs in this talk, so might as well start you off with one. Uh, my name is Maltes Garobke, I'm an AI programmer <coughs> at Avalanche Studios in New York. I was also here last year in the same room, gave a talk about Radix sort, where I generalized it, which makes sorting faster than n log n. I still feel like more people should use that, which is why I'd like to mention it again. But this talks about hash tables, um, which is a obviously a hugely important data structure, <coughs> some say the most, the most important one. And um, it's seen some new developments in recent years, because I think um, what I wrote here is that Unordered map being a little bit slow has kind of been a blessing in disguise because lots of people went out and thought that they could do better than standard unordered map. And um, often they could, and then we saw really good developments in hash tables in C++ in the last couple of years. So this talk is going to be me talking about me working off and on for, on hash tables for years and um, and what I learned about them and what the improvements are and what, and then at the end I also show a new hash table that I wrote <coughs> just for this talk, which is going to be my new favorite hash table, which has lots of nice properties. Um, to start, I'd like to, um, as a baseline, I'd like to just measure the performance of the standard containers, including the, the ordered containers, as you asked. So um, here is a, a graph measuring the lookup time in a standard unordered map. So what this is, is um, I, in the, I, I created a benchmark where I uh, create an un unordered map of a certain size, and it's the size is on the x-axis, like it ha either has four elements or four millions or, or some other size. And then what I'm doing is in a loop, I'm calling find on this map over and over again, looking up keys that are actually going to be in this map. So these are all successful lookups. And then what happens is that um, when the table is small, or, or the other thing I do, if I forget, is um, at the end of the loop, I measure how long did the loop take, and then I divide by the number of iterations. That gives me the time for the average lookup. <coughs> and so what happens in that benchmark is on the left-hand side, um, when the table is small, since we are spinning on it in a loop, it's going to be in cache pretty quickly. And then all the lookups are going to be pretty fast, and we're going to get this nice uh, low, perform uh, low, low numbers of time there to, to look up keys. And on the right-hand side, when the table is too big to fit in cache, we're going to have to do, um, we're going to have to go to memory more often and that's when the table really slows, uh, really slows down. So you can see exactly where the L3 cache ends and where it no longer fits in L3 cache, which is where it falls off a cliff and gets much slower. So I'd like to compare this with um, <coughs> the other standard containers. So I'm going to, um, but to do that, I'm actually going to zoom in on this first segment here, just from size 4 to 40. Um, so if I zoom in on that, <coughs> we see that there's like some noise in the measurement, but let's ignore that noisiness. We see it hovers around 12 nanoseconds to look up an item in this map. This is if you're spinning on it and it's already all in cache. Now, I'm going to add standard map to this, which is at this size is much faster, which should be surprising to you because if you know anything about these two containers, you should know that uh, analog map has fewer constraints, so it should be faster than standard map. Um, but at this size, when everything's in cache, um, standard map is actually slower, uh, is actually faster. And this would be one. Of, this would this would be the first thing we'll fix. Before that, let's um, also add linear search to this, which is. Um, just, I just have a standard vector and just put a bunch of keys in there and then do a linear search through it to find my, my item. It starts off much faster and then quickly gets slower, naturally. And then there's um, boost flat map, which is just a sorted vector, which at this size, when everything's in cache, has basically the same performance as standard map, which is what you would expect. Now I'm going to zoom out on this to have up to size 400 in this container. And then we can see linear search <coughs> gets much slower because now the container is 10 times bigger, so it gets 10 times slower. Um, the other containers stay mostly unchanged there, but if we zoom out again, well, the first thing we see is uh, linear search goes way up, up, in, up into the sky, because it's going to do that every time I go up a factor 10, so I'm going to just remove it from this graph. And then we see that at this size, uh, standard map and flat map are getting slower than unordered map. And, and this graph right here basically shows why we have a hash table in the standard now, because hash tables promise constant lookup times. So the old containers, like as the container gets bigger, the lookups get slower. An unordered map has the idea that no matter the size of the container, things are going to have constant lookup time. Um, <coughs> let me zoom out again on that. And then on this size, we see that standard map is now getting slower than flat map. So what happens here is we're now, we're now roughly in L3 cache. So we no longer fit in L1 or L2 cache. So 
Now the pointer fetches are starting to hurt us in that hurting standard map. We zoom out again, now there's an interesting thing, which is that unordered map is now getting slower than boost flat map, which is a thing that also shouldn't happen. But what, what's going on here is that, um, is that flat map is like this really nice densely packed array, and unordered map is, um, has, has memory overhead for each entry in the table. So this is just a table from int to int, and uh, unordered map has to at least store one pointer with each value, which is eight bytes. So that alone like doubles the memory usage. So at this size, unordered map no longer fits in any of my caches, and we have to go to memory to look up <coughs> items. And so that's why it gets slower. If you then zoom out again, then, um, then flat map gets slower again, because now it also no longer fits in cache. And if I zoom out a final time, we see that uh, standard map and, unordered and flat map are going to keep on getting slower as, this, as, this, um, as they get bigger. Where unordered map is going to stay mostly constant, it's still going to get a little bit slower, but it's going to hover somewhere around the 300 nanoseconds at the end there, uh, in the long term. Um, <coughs> so we saw two parts here where the map is slow, like first when it's really small and it's slower than standard map, which it should never be, and second there where it's um, slower than boost flat map. So I'd like to actually discuss like why is this map slow, or more generally, why are hash tables <coughs> slow? in general, because um, while there can be many reasons that make hash tables slow, I found that there's three big reasons. The first one is obviously uh, the cache misses, which is um, if you just have bad memory layout. The second big reason is um, if you have a long delay to the first comparison. So what I mean here is I mean the time after the hash function finishes and the first equality can happen. So how much time happens between the hash function finishing and, and and me actually doing my comparisons to like see if I find the key in the map. Um, and this time is particularly important because it's on the critical path of, of, of looking things up. And unordered map does really badly here because it has an integer, integer modulo on that path. Uh, integer, integer modulo. I'll explain that at a later slide also why, why it does that. But then there's a third reason why hash tables are slow in general, which is unnecessary comparisons. Which is if you, um, like the ideal hash table, you would like look up one item, it's immediately what you're looking for, and and you found, and, and you would be done. But um, usually you get like hash collisions or you sh uh, mix different items together and then that <laughs> slows down your table. So I'm gonna give you a preview for what we're gonna do in this talk, and how we're gonna optimize hash tables using these three things. So this is the graph for unordered map, and then the first optimization we're gonna do is just reduce the delay between the hash function and the equality function. And that gets us all the way down here instantly. This is not even changing the memory layout. Then um, we're going to reduce cache misses, which is the other big optimization that gets us down there. Then we're going to reduce unnecessary, co unnecessary <coughs> comparisons, getting us down there. And finally, we're going to write a really ha fast hash table that um, has fewer cache misses than the previous ones. At that point, we're going to take a step back, look at a different hash table, which is slower, but this guy saves memory, which we're going to then optimize a tiny amount by reducing unnecessary comparisons. And then at the end, I'm going to present a new hash table that I um, that's my new favorite hash table because it combines all the learned lessons of like all these different um, hash tables. So it has like um, less delay between the hash and the equality. It has um, fewer cache misses and like fewer <coughs> unnecessary, unnecessary comparisons and all the nice things. Okay, so when measuring hash tables, there's a question of what should we measure. And um, there's the four things here. That's usually what you measure. It's like successful lookups, meaning looking up a key that's in the map. Unsuccessful <coughs> lookup, looking up a key, but it's not in the, in the map, so it, so it returns the end pointer. Then there's inserts and there's, there's arrays. And these have kind of have a hierarchy between them where some are more important than others. So the top two are really important, and insertions are actually like usually less important because you do less inserts than lookups. And, um, and then arrays at the bottom is, um, is the least important of these because they, um, well, it's not used as commonly if, if you look at how people use hash tables. <coughs> so when we optimize hash tables, what, what we want to do is we want to make the lookups as fast as possible. After we're done with that, we want to make the insert as fast as possible, but, but not if it would hurt the lookups. So we want to lock that down. And after that, we try to make the arrays as fast as possible, but not if it would hurt the insert or lookups. And then there's a, um, actually in this talk, I actually only talk about lookups because I had to somehow get everything into one talk. Then there's, um, the, there's another consideration, which is whether or not the table, whether the table is in cache or not when you do a lookup. Um, 
And like what I had in this graph is I said on the left hand side, since the table is small and we're just spinning on it, it's always going to be in cash. On the right hand side, it's not, it's too big to fit in cash. So um, what I'd like to have is a benchmark that doesn't have this thing where it's going to be in cash on the left hand side, where in this section, we still are able to somehow measure like if the table is not cached. And what you do for that is you, you, instead of building one table, you build thousands and thousands of tables. You <laughs> fill up a good chunk of memory um, just with hash tables. And then um, you still do the same loop, but you're just calling find over and over again. But every single find you do is on a randomly chosen table. So you're essentially measuring what's the first lookup on a table when it's not yet in cache. Because you fill up your whole memory, so um, that can't all fit in cache. And that is going to be this graph, which um, we have got standard, uh, another map at the bottom in blue and map at the standard map in, in red at the top. And they both now start off at like 300 nanoseconds, which is where the other graph ended. And then standard map just goes up from there. Um, to see, like then I'm also going to add linear search again, which is um, starts off much faster and then quickly gets slower, obviously. But what changed here to before is that now Linear search stays the fastest option for quite a long time. So um, it's hard to see because there's a log scale on the x-axis, but like up to size like 150 or so, or even slightly above that, <laughs> linear search is the fastest option here. So what that means is that if you're not going to do multiple lookups on your table, if you, if you use your table rarely and it probably won't be in cache, then linear search is actually a good option for quite large tables with like more than 100 items in them even. But then there's also flat map, and flat map has the same nice properties where it's just a single array, and it's, it's also fast and it stays fast. So this is the other option that you may want to consider. Um, this graph, this cache miss lookup graph, I actually won't be using a whole lot because it's um, <coughs> for hash tables, you just get these flat lines, so it's not very interesting there. But I still wanted to establish it as a baseline just to like convince you that um, the, the right-hand side of the other graph establishes like the is, is good enough to like establish what a cache miss lookup would, would, would be. So with that out of the way, let's do a let's let's make this uh, faster. So let's do our first optimization, which is um, this integer modulo in hash tables. So integer modulo is um, you use it to get the the hash value, which could be any large number. You have to get it into a small fixed range, which fits into your table. So if your table is size 17, you have to get it into a range from 0 to 16, and you do that by doing this. You just do the hash mod size, and that distributes a large value into your, um, into your size. <coughs> the problem with this is that it's really slow, and on my machine this takes roughly 9 nanoseconds. Um, and as far as I know, computers just can't make this fast. Like, this is not a, like, integer modulo is just one of those complicated operations that they can't make fast in hardware. So, um, the first easy alternative to that is to, um, is to, is, is, is to if, is, if you ensure that your hash table is sized to be a power of 2, then uh, you can use a much cheaper operation, which is just the binary AND. And if your hash table, is, if your size is a power of 2, then what this does is it chops off all the top bits and only keeps the bottom bits, and, um, and that gets the value into the right range. And on my machine, this takes roughly 0 nanoseconds, <laughs> plus or minus some. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. So th this, is, this, is, uh, yeah. this is essentially free, because it's just one cycle. Um, so let's, 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 do, let's see how fast that is. So here's the old graph for, um, for lookup times. And um, I'm going to add the, the I, I call it scar unordered map, which is just my namespace with unordered map. And it's all the way down here. It's instantly the fastest thing. And it beats boost flat map, and it's going to stay faster. Is, sorry. Yes? Is this still conforming to the standard unordered map? Is there any reason why? This one is still conforming. I didn't change anything else yet. So it would be called implementation issue if a library doesn't do this. Uh, this, I will. If you just plug this in, it'll have problems because you have higher requirements of the hash function. Yes, I, I'll go into that. I go into what you have to do to make this actually usable. Um, but I, I, like before that, actually, like, I'd like to zoom in on the first section again, where we're really small tables. Oh, sorry, I forgot to repeat the questions. But um, the question was whether or not this is still standard conformant, and it, and it is. Um, so if I zoom in on this first section, this is what it looked like with all the previous things. Um, bit noisily, sorry about that. But here's this new hash table. And it's, um, it's instantly the fastest thing. And it's, it's like it's 9 nanoseconds lower than the other one, which is nice. And um, it's beaten by linear search very briefly, but then it quickly becomes the fastest thing and stays the fastest thing. 
Uh, I'm also going to show you the cache miss lookup again just once, which looked like this. And here's a new table, and it's just a parallel line underneath the other one. And this is the only time I'll do this because this, this benchmark is, doesn't look that interesting because it's we can see everything we need to see from the other um, graph as well. Um, Then, this was the graph of the unordered map and, um, and the two unordered maps, and, but there's a problem here, which is that there's not just one unordered map, because there's different implementations. So I'm also going to add the libc++ unordered map, which is all the way up here. It's slower than the, um, libs, uh, than the GCC unordered map. <coughs> um, I could go into why that is, but it's not that interesting. The other most common implementation is the Dinkumware implementation, which ships with Visual Studio, and it's all the way down there. And so um, what that one does, or oh, this is from Visual Studio 2015, just for completeness sake. What that one does is it also uses a power of two size, but um, <coughs> it, it's a little bit slower than, than, than mine because this one, um, it has a more complicated hash function. Because when you use a power of two, you're just chopping off all the top bits. So you have to be really confident that there's nothing important in those, in those upper bits. And uh, if, if, you, if you're not confident in that, then you're going to get um, lots of hash collisions. And so what they do is they make the hash function more complicated. I mean, this is just for integers, but um, so they hash together all the bits in the integer so that it, you get um, that the upper bits also count. Now, I actually, if you use my map, it's not going to be using the power of two by default. By default, I actually do a trick <coughs> that makes inter integer modulo faster, which puts me down here. Um, it's, it has all the same benefits as the upper guy, but it's, it, it's almost as fast as power of two um, search, as power of two size. This I won't be explaining at this point. If you want, I can explain it at the end, because I've got some bonus slides at the end. Um, but it's, 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 um, you can make integer modulo faster if you're a bit creative. And I didn't invent this, which is why I don't want to talk about it too much. <coughs> um, cool. Let's do the second optimization, cache misses. Um, so here is a simple unordered map. This is pretty much what mine looks like. It's just an array on the left-hand side, area of pointers, and each of these pointers is a start of a linked list. And um, um, to show what this would um, work like, let's look up key 11 in this map. So first thing we would do is we would hash key 11, and it would give <coughs> us this slot. We follow that pointer, which brings us to key 3. We compare that key, and that's not the right key, so we have to follow the linked list one down further. This is what we're looking for, and with that we're happy, and we found our key in the map. Uh, pretty straightforward. So the easiest way to optimize this uh, for, ca hash collision, uh, for cache misses <coughs> is to use what's called open addressing, and that's to just use a flat array. So we literally just take this thing, get rid of all the pointers, and put the values right into that first array. And this is just going to be like, it could be a st standard vector of just key value pairs. There's one problem with this, is we have to do something about these empty slots now, because um, Sorry, because we need to have some bit pattern that indicates <coughs> emptiness. And, um, and what you usually do here is like this gets complicated because you have to have a bit pattern that can never be a valid key. But if your key is an integer, then any bit pattern is valid. So the way to solve this is to just tell the client of the hash table to provide you some key that will never ever be used. And that just promise to never insert that key. And then that's going to be your, in, uh, your empty indices. Um, there's a hash table that does this. It's available, uh, open source. It's called Google Dense Hash Map. It's uh, old and stable and well, um, well understood. And I'm gonna. Oh, sorry, I forgot about this part. Let's look up key 11 again, which um, we hash to that slot. It's not the right thing. We move one down. We compare it equally, and yes, it, it does the right thing. Um, so that's. Um, this is confusing. Um, what, what, I, I didn't get it. What did you just do? Okay, yeah, so I, I tried looking up key 11. So key 11, <coughs> the way I look it up, is the first thing I hash it, and the hash instantly brings us to the key 3 slot, because it, it, it gets assigned to one of the slots. Then key 3 is not the right key, so we, we have to stop, uh, we, we have to keep on searching through the table. So we just go one item down, key 11 is what we were looking for, and so with that we finished our lookup, because we're looking for key 11. Does that part make sense? No. <laughs> Sorry. If you call it arrays on that table? Sorry, what? Uh, where do you stop searching? When you I st empty? Yes, for unsuccessful lookup, I stop searching once I have the first empty slot. That's the part Then you can't, you can't support arrays on that table. No, you can, oh, well, the que there, there, there's questions about how erasing on this table works. And um, 
it's you can support erasing it's just harder yeah. it's just tombstones <laughs> yes yeah the, an yeah, the answer is the answer is you insert tombstones when you ins when you erase yeah. but actually i'm not sure how much time i want to spend on this table because it's, it's like one step along the path to making a more fast table yes another question does this rely on having low load factors in order to maintain performance this very much relies on low load factors to maintain performance yes that's, that's a correct statement. And one other question. When we implemented this a bazillion years ago, yes. we used a, a second hash key so that when you had a miss, you didn't just linearly walk, but you yes. did something else. Is that observed something you consider? Um, <clears throat> the question is about whether you want to do a, a second hash function on, on collision. Um, that's a well-known thing, and it's, it's, yeah, it's, it's commonly used. Um, I, I'm, in this talk, I'm doing different things. Um, so I'd like to, okay. because there's many like there's many ways to do this, and actually a dense hash map, which I'm going to use as comparison, doesn't do a linear search either. It actually uses quadratic probing, where it, it jumps bigger and bigger steps. <laughs> I mean, the first step is correct; it just jumps one, but then the second step it will jump further and further with each more, with each additional step. But let's just look at how fast this is. So here's my analog map, which um, is the power of two size, and actually all tables from here on forward will, be, will use power of two because that just makes them easy to compare and gets rid of like extra latency in there. And here is the uh, Google Dense hash map. And it's, um, yeah, it's, just, it's, it's, it's faster on the right-hand side over here because we've got fewer cache misses. But on the left-hand side, actually, it's a little bit slower than the analog map because when the map is small and fits in cache, um, what hurts us is, is that we are um, we're doing more unnecessary comparisons in, in the dense hash map because now we're just mixing all the different buckets together and we don't keep them separate anymore. <coughs> and in analog map, we only ever had to compare things that at least hash to the same slot. Where in dense hash map, since things can get shuffled around, you may <coughs> have more unnecessary, unnecessary comparisons. Yes? And the, uh, the other one that Mike, Mike, as Kai mentioned earlier, this one can't be standard conforming because you lose its right <coughs> reference stability on a rehash. Next slide. Ah, okay, okay. Let, let's do another observation. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, so reference stability, as you mentioned. So we just lost reference stability. What is reference stability? Um, it's a property where when you insert an item into a map, into an analog map, the pointer to that item will remain, if, if you take an address of it, that remains valid as for until you erase the item again. And it doesn't matter what else you do to the table. If you like in, insert a bunch of other tables, uh, other keys, or if you rehash the table, your pointer will always remain valid. And that really limits what you can do with the hash table. And that's the main reason why another map is always slow, is because f they can't put things into an array, for example, because if the array has to grow, then you have to move the items around, and then th the pointers become invalidated. So we just lost that property. And let's, um, if we lose that property, let's also try building a linked list that doesn't have this property. So we're going to have the same analog map. And we're going to take all the, first, the, all the beginnings of the linked list and just put them straight into that first array. <laughs> then all the, all the hash collisions that form th are further down the linked list we're going to also put those into like a second array that we use for hash collisions. And there's also lots of empty slots in here, but um, those are now easier to handle because we can put a special bit pattern into the pointer value to indicate emptiness. Now, um, to show how this works, I'm going to insert some values here. So I'm going to insert something that hashes to that slot. First thing that I would do is the first key I would just literally insert right there. And then the second key, uh, if, if I insert that again, I get, I get a hash collision, I would put it into the backup array. Like pretty, like, and then I would start building a linked list like that. And here's what, here's what dense hash map looked like in performance. And here is the, um, this hash table, which I call pointer hash map. And it's actually faster, surprisingly, because we also now get the nice uh, array behavior. So there's um, a few things I'd like to point out here. The first thing is that in this section over here, um, it's actually slower. And the reason is that we now have this eight bytes memory overhead per entry. And what that does to us is that this table falls out of L3 cache first. And so at that point, we already have to go to memory and dense hash map is still faster because it, it fits in cache. But then on the right hand side, we're faster. And the reason why we're faster is that, um, well, we're doing fewer unnecessary comparisons. I wrote here that the first pointer in direction into the first array gives us the right in quotation marks value to compare against, where right means I mean, either it's immediately the right thing, or at least it's something that hashed to the same slot, which dense hash map didn't have. Dense hash map, you can get unrelated things that you have to compare against. Um, so this doesn't seem right. Like, it doesn't seem good that like a linked list would be faster. So let's also optimize dense hash map some more. Yes, sorry. 
the sawtooth on your graph, is that some type of caching uh, mm. behavior? Or? Great question. So he's asking about the, um, the spikiness, where it goes up and down. What happens is um, when the table gets full, like so, so the, the table reallocates when it gets too full. But as it gets more full, lookups become more and more slow. And um, so what you're seeing here is that at, at the bottom of each of these um, things, it had just reallocated and had just grown and like there's mo now more space and you get fewer collisions and all that stuff. And then as the table gets more and more full, before it reallocates, it gets slower. And then so you always like, anytime you have a hash table um, <coughs> or, well, there's different ways of visualizing hash table um, performance and sometimes people like to go from like to draw a line from peak to peak so that um, but I actually I like this graph because I like to see the the difference between the valleys and, and the peaks it's like, error uh, bars. Hmm? it's like error bars yes it's like it's it, it's in a sense it's like error bars yeah um, <coughs> so yes let's optimize dense hash map and what I'm going to do for that is I'm going to use this method called Robin Hood hashing uh, Robin Hood hashing has this really appealing idea which is that what if we could get the best possible layout for open addressing, where we always can guarantee it's the fewest number of comparisons that you could get. And the way it does that, and this is where the name comes from, is that it, is, it, it, like, it divides these slots into like rich slots, which are exactly where they want to be, and poor slots, which, are, which have to live further away from their ideal position. Um, and then we're going to take from the rich and give to the poor, and that's what Robin Hood did. So, um, how does this work? Let me walk through it. So the first thing we do is we add some metadata. It's just one byte overhead where we store um, the distance to the ideal position. So key zero is exactly where it wants to be. So we write number zero there. We use minus one for empty slots. Key two and three are also where they want to be. Key 11 really wants to be in that slot. It like hashed to that slot. So you write the number one to indicate that it's, um, it's one slot removed from its ideal position. And then key 19 also wants to be in that slot. So you write the number two to indicate that it wants it, it, it's two slots removed from the ideal position. And then if we were to insert an item in here, um, let me try inserting key 10. Um, the first thing we do is we allocate on the stack like the same struct and we just give it distance zero. Now we hash it and it hashes into this uh, key here. And in that slot we already find something and it has the same distance so we can't do anything with that. So what we're going to do is we're going to increment the counter on the right hand side to one and then move one down in the, in the slot. Here we find key 3, and key 3 is a rich slot, and we are a poor slot because we're one removed from our ideal position. So we take from the rich and give to the poor, and we just swap these two values. So now key 10 is in the map, and we have to find a new insertion point for key 3. Um, so what we do is on key 3, we now increment the counter and move one down. Here we find an item that has the same distance, so we can't do anything. We increment the counter again, move down, same distance, increment the counter and move down. We find an empty slot, and we insert the value here. And this, I claim, is, 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 is like it's a pretty simple mechanism, but it, like, this gives us the best possible layout. If we were to swap items here, like, we could either get other equivalent layouts or worse layouts, where you would have to do more comparisons. But you can never get anything where you, do, where you have to do fewer comparisons than this. So let's look at that in a graph. Uh, here's the old tables, and then here is, the, uh, here is what this one looks like, which I call scar flat hash map. And it's a Robin Hood hashing table. Hmm. Hmm. Are you still using the linked list as well, the second table. There's no linked list anymore. The, like the question was about whether or not I'm still using a linked list. Now everything is in one array and we just shuffle things around in there to, until we get the best layout in that one area. Yes, another question. Um, doesn't that seem biased towards the insertion order? Yeah. Uh, the question is whether that's biased towards the insertion order. Yes, it is. Um, it is... I don't know when that would affect you and there's actually... Um, well, <coughs> let's say yes, it is. It's biased towards the insertion order, and I, I, but I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if that matters. Or I mean, th this is a graph of the average lookup times. You could always construct like bad cases, and then. I guess what I was just saying is yeah. like you're looking for key eleven, <coughs> and the yes. key eleven was like the first one you inserted, and then it'll just probably get bumped down from other keys. Yes. And then your your test is is biased away because now you've got to do more jumps to, to get the key alone than you would have originally. Right? Yeah, yeah, um, that's a fair comment. I, I don't, I, I, um, I mean, all I'm doing here is I'm just measuring the average lookup time, so I don't, um, which is, as far as I'm concerned, that's the right thing to do. So I don't know, 
I, I don't. I would. I would need a use case where you depend on the insertion order, and then I would want to measure that. But I don't know. I. I don't have that here. Um, <coughs> yeah. So what I want to say though is that, like, um, as far as I know, Robin Hood hashing is still what you want to do if you want to write the fastest tables. Like somebody has beaten this table by now, but they also use Robin Hood ha hashing. So um, as far as I know, that's still what you want to do. But then I want to take a step, another step back and look at a different perspective, which is that um, last year at CBPCon, uh, Matt Calicandes from Google also gave a talk about Google's new hash table. Here's just a picture from the talk. Actually, who saw the talk? OK, a few people. <laughs> um, so he had one quote in there, which was that he said, um, more than 4% of Google's RAM is owned by a hash table. And that's just in C++. So one thing that they had is they want, like, so 4% of Google's RAM is, is a lot of money because they have millions of computers. And so um, they wanted to write a hash table that, uh, that is faster without using more memory. And my flat hash map is really not that. So let me talk about the memory overhead of this flat hash map. <coughs> so here's what it looked like, and here's what that would look like in C++. Uh, as, as like a single entry would look like, and I've got like one byte overhead for the distance from desired position, and I've got my um, um, <coughs> my value, which would be a, a pair in this case because it's a map. Yes, question. Are the Wyman tissues going to mean you consume more than eight bits for that empty other front? Eight Next slide. Ah, um, so <laughs> <laughs> the um, yeah, so this section in between actually has padding bytes inserted in it. So um, so yeah, depending on your alignment of, of the value underneath. You're going to get like, if, it, if the bottom value is like eight bytes aligned, you're going to get seven, bit, seven bytes of padding here. So this column on the left-hand side doesn't look like that. It actually is much wider because you don't have one byte overhead. You've got whatever your alignment is. And there's a second thing that's wrong with this table is, as it is, which is that it's too full. So the, the, the flat hash ramp has a max load factor of 0 0.5. And the max load factor controls when the table grows. And 0 0.5 means when it's half full, it would grow. So this table is more than half full, so it wouldn't look like this would actually look like this. And just pretend, pretend this is one long array. I just had to put it next to each other. But what you can see, there's lots of empty slots here and lots of wasted memory. And it's, um, yeah, it's not the table you want to use if you want to save memory. Question. When yes. you say it has 0.5, why isn't that a configurable value? It is. It's a configurable value. So the question. 0.5 is about right. Next slide. OK. Um, <laughs> so the question was about the max load factor. Um, yes, another question. So you're using an int. 80. What happens if you end up with uh, one that's forced to be more than 127 away? Do you force a reallocation then or something? Um, the, the question is, I'm, I'm only using one byte to count this. And what happens if, you, if something is like more than 128 away? Uh, yes, in that case, you would reallocate. But this doesn't happen uh, because you get the best possible layout. I mean, it happens if you have a bad hash function. But then I can't control that. I just say, don't have a bad hash function. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a thing you have to pass into the table, right? So it's like, um, it's a choice you make when you use this table, basically. OK, so let me graph what this max load factor does, because you can configure it, as the question was. So I've got here the same table with max load factor 0 0.5 at the bottom and 87.5% at the top in, in, in red. And you can see the pattern here, which is that the 0 0.5 reallocates when it's half full, and it's going to go down to 25% full. And the other one's going to reallocate when it's 87.5% full down to 40, roughly 44% full. So there's some overlap between these two. But um, what happens here is that each hash table has kind of has this, um, has like this, this, this curve where like the more full the hash table is, the slower your lookups get. So these curves would look something like this. And with your max load factor, you can, you can, you can control which segment along this curve is your hash table going to be. If you have a higher max load factor, you're going to be high up on this curve always. And if you have a lower one, you're going to be lower down when you, when you reallocate. Now, this is actually not the full graph. This is just the, part of the, 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 the first part of the graph. If I zoom out and show you the full graph, including the cache miss part on the right-hand side, <coughs> we see that the high max load factor is looking kind of ugly with like really high spikes and like slow performance. Um, it's actually still faster than an unordered map, but it's just not looking that pretty. So this is why we want to go with a low max load factor. Yes. If that's true, why, why not consider something like 0.25? It, I know they're diminishing returns. Yes. The point is it's not a sensitive function of whether it's 0.5 or 0.4 or 0.6. <coughs> that's not something everybody has to go experiment with because 0.5 is, you know, unless you're really ready to tune your, your system, yes. 0.5 is fine, right? Yes. The question is what's a good default? And the good default is, is 0.5. And why, why not go with lower numbers? 
You could, but you don't get the same. You don't get. Yeah, you get diminishing returns. Yes. Leading question: Does the standard have a bad default? No, the standard does not. Uh, the question is: Does the standard have a bad default? So what happens is every single hash table has a different curve for performance. An unordered map doesn't get the spiky, and I go into that later actually, where um, chaining hash tables do not get this this bad behavior when they get more full. I mean, they also get slower, but they don't get this much slower. Um, so let me go back and talk about Google's table because they also made a trick where it doesn't get this much slower. So um, I'm going to turn my flat hash map into Google's flat hash map. They use the same name, unfortunately, but um, I'm just going to transform mine into theirs one step at a time. So the first thing that they do is that they, they don't use Robin Hood hashing. Instead, they store the hash of the value. And they actually don't store the full hash. They only store seven bits of the hash, which I'm going to indicate like this. Um, so we're going to use one bit to indicate empty, and then the other seven bits um, are going to be used for the hash of the, of, the, of the value. Then they pull this metadata out of the array into a separate array, and that's, that, that, that re removes all the padding bytes. So now everything is nicely, densely packed together. <coughs> and then the final thing they do is that they increase the max load factor to 87.5, which is the upper graph I just showed you, but on theirs it doesn't look this bad. So this table could actually be smaller, but this is the <coughs> smallest table they can have because this is uh, 16 bytes, and you always need at least 16 bytes of metadata. And the reason is that um, they use SSE instructions, and SSE instructions operate on 16 bytes at a time. So <laughs> what is an SSE instruction? It's, 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 it's a form of SIMD instructions, which is something that CPUs have had for almost 20 years now, and it's widely supported. And SIMD stands for Single Instruction Multiple Data, which is that um, yeah, you operate on 16 bytes at a time, and like, it's kind of like whatever you can fit in 16 bytes, you can do that. So you, you, the usual use case for me is you put four floats in there, then you can do math on four floats in the same speed as if you're doing it on, on, on a single float. So you're four times faster, ideally. But here we're just going to operate on the 16 bytes um, like <coughs> a, a, as separate bytes. So let's do a lookup using SIMD comparisons. I'm going to look up, in this case, uh, key three in this table. So the first thing we do <coughs> is we're going to um, hash the value and keep the seven bits, which is going to give us this h3 <laughs> value. And then we're going to call this intrinsic function called set one epi 8 and that, uh, that gives us a 16-byte SIMD register that has this H3 value splatted out across all the values. Then what we can do is we can call this other intrinsic called MM compare equal API 8. The middle part's important, and it stands for compare equal. And this compares all 16 bytes in, in once, and it takes the same amount of time as if you're comparing a single byte. And that gives us this, um, <coughs> this, this register, which has zeros <coughs> in all the values that, are, that didn't compare equal, and has FF in the value that compared equal. So that immediately gives us like the right thing to look for. So we just have to get it out of this uh, SIMD register into a normal, normal integer again. For that, there's this other function called move mask. Move mask um, returns a normal integer, which is 16 bits. And it looks like this. It has zeros in all the, in all the uh, bits that were zero in there. And there's a one in the fourth bit over there, because the fourth entry in that register had, FF in it, had the FF value in it. <coughs> and so um, then the final thing we have to do is we have to turn this integer into a index, so we're going to call bit scan forward, which also is known <laughs> under, under other names, but it's just a function that, um, that returns the first set bit in, a, in an integer, like back to normal integers now. And that's just going to return number three. So now we can compare key three, which is the key we're looking for, and so with that we found what we're looking for in this table, and, 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 and we're happy. So this was quite a long sequence of instructions, and I said earlier that that's a bad thing, where like you don't want a long sequence of instruction after the hash function to the comparison. But the benefit that we're getting here is that uh, we're comparing 16 entries at a time. And there's a very low ratio of false positives here. Because with seven bits, like a false positive is like one in 128. So um, we can save ourselves a lot of, lot of comparisons in, in, in the second array. Um, so we basically only ever have to do like one comparison. And there's few unnecessary comparisons. So that's a really nice property. <coughs> um, Let's look at what that looks like. So here's, here's, the, here's well, actually I should say I, I implemented their table <coughs> myself and this is, this is um, what that looks like because they haven't published their table yet. But I'm like 95% sure I got the right thing. Um, <coughs> so it's not a clear win actually. I mean I'd like to point out one thing which is over in this section. It's the fastest thing and this is what, because we have the lower memory overhead now. We've got one byte per entry. Um, and so in this section, it's still in L3 cache. Everything else is already in memory. So that's going to make it faster. But then up here, we're slower. 
And the reason we're slower is that we have two memory fetches now. We have to fetch the metadata, and then we also have to fetch the data in the second array, because we have to always do the key comparison. And, um, and like, I mean, so what they do actually is like, it's a, the, the two arrays are actually in one heap allocation, but it's still going to be separate cache lines, so you always have two memory fetches. So it doesn't look too good from this graph, but I want to convince you that this is actually a really good hash table. And for that, there's a, a different graph, which is the, um, the time it takes to look up an item that's not in, in the map. So far, I've only been showing you successful lookups. And like there's the second graph, which is unsuccessful lookups. So you're spinning on the table, calling find over and over again, looking up keys that are not in the map. Um, let's go to that graph. <laughs> so here's what it looks like for a dense hash map. Here's for the pointer hash map, which was a uh, linked list in arrays. And here is the um, Robin Hood hashing, which is roughly the same speed here as the, as the pointer one. And then here is the new table. And it's looking really good. So the first thing is that down here, it stays in L3 cache for a really long time. Because in unsuccessful lookups, we often only have to look at the first array. We, never, we rarely have to, do, have to actually fetch the second, anything from the second array. And so what happens is that um, since the metadata is so tightly packed, we get this, um, a lot of it fits in cache. And then like, so, so pretty quickly, all of this is going to be in cache and we're going to get these uh, lookups very quickly. And so we stay down there for a very long time because we only have one byte per entry. So lots of entries fit in cache. Not, but then um, even on the right hand side, once we're out of cache, even there it remains faster because we get this nice property where we just look at the first 16, none are equal and we can leave the table immediately. And we don't even have to go into the second array. There's a second thing that stands out though, which is the spikiness. And um, these spikes, they're caused by, um, by big clusters, which you get from the high load factor. Yes, a question in the back. So I have a question about when uh, you, you compare the metadata and you discover that none of the entries match, mm -hmm. how do you know not to check the next metadata block? Right, good question. So the question is, if I, if I, um, <coughs> if I compare the metadata and, and they're all not equal, um, why, like, how do I make sure that I don't have to go to the next block? And the answer is I have to keep on probing until I find an empty slot which is often going to be in the first slot, but then sometimes I have to keep on going and like find more. And I actually... Completely empty metadata slot. No, just a single one. If a single one's empty... So we got... We got comparison as well with like an empty slot. Yes, we're going to do the first comparison, and then if, if none of them compare equal, we're going to do a second comparison with just, is any of these empty? Which is also going to be a single, a single cycle because we compare 16 at once. So it's really cheap to like find an empty slot there. It's just... Um, <coughs> yeah, and if a single one in there is empty, we know we can stop, we can stop um, searching through <coughs> this table. Um, okay, but these spikes, so this is actually about the same thing, about the, um, uh, what happens if we have to keep on, um, like, like what happens if, if, if none of them compare equal. So let me ha have a slide about clusters. So here's what the table looks like, and if I insert a few more values, then what happens is once the table gets somewhat full, if you now insert more values, um, like let's say I insert something and it hashes to this slot, I have to insert it in the next empty slot, which is down there. <coughs> And then what that does is like as your table gets bigger and more full, you end up like connecting all these um, buckets together and you get these long chains of, um, of slots without any empty slot in between. And so it's pretty harmless here if you just have a small table like this because it's just still a single uh, chunk. But, um, but as when the table gets bigger, you get this thing where you get these big clusters and once they're really big, they're more likely to grow and you get this like self-reinforcing um, behavior where, where they keep on growing bigger with the higher load factors. <coughs> and um, I wanted to quantify this, so I ran a simulation of this behavior. And then I found like once your table is somewhat big, like I have 10,000 items here, you find that 20% uh, of your items are going to be in clusters of at least 100 items long. So like one in five lookups is going to be like a pretty long lookup because you have to scan for quite a while to find an empty slot in this table. And they actually they get much bigger, they get like size 300 or 400. So I, I stepped through some of these like spikes to just see like what happens, and it is it just is kind of sad because you're doing one comparison after another, and like after you looked at like more than 100 items, you finally find an empty slot, and then you can stop probing for for because um, now you know <laughs> that your item's not in, in the in the table. <coughs> okay, um, I'm actually gonna um, yeah I'm I'm, I'm gonna um, conclude on this table, um, which I should once again say it's not it's my implementation on their table, but I talked to Matt Kalikandas in person and we compared our notes, so I'm 95% sure there's only going to be very small differences if any. There's not going to be any like big algorithmic uh, differences. So I've got this amazing performance on unsuccessful lookups, <laughs> but then for successful lookups, that second pointer fetch is hurting us. 
Um, actually, I should have said a thing about the clusters before, because I actually I think they made the cutoff at just the right point, because they made the cutoff exactly before the clusters get really bad. Um, so I actually think that like the spikes, they never get really high. So it, I think it's actually the right thing to do, what they did there. Just forgot to say that. So how do we make this thing faster? <coughs> so the, um, the first idea I had because of this uh, second point of fetch that's hurting us in the successful lookups is that um, let's interleave the metadata in the data. So we're going to store 16 bytes of metadata followed by 16, bytes, uh, followed by 16 entries of data and, and, and have it interleaving like that. Because then if we fetch the metadata, we're also going to get a full cache line and we're going to get like part of the, we're going to get 48 bytes of data at the same time, which is often going to save us from doing a second point of fetch. <coughs> and this doesn't work that well. It kind of puts you like in this between place where your, your unsuccessful lookups get slower because now all your metadata is really spread out. Because you still get all the same clusters, but now every single metadata is in a separate cache line and you no longer get this nice packed dense behavior. So um, that doesn't work. Successful lookups do get a little bit faster on average, but it's not a big enough win to, to actually be worth it. Because um, we just lost a really nice property and we didn't gain a really good property. Um, <coughs> one second. Okay, second idea is let's use Robin Hood hashing. Because that worked really well for dense hash maps, so let's also try it here. So we've got one byte of metadata to work with, which means we have to somehow divide that up. We have to ask how many bits does Robin Hood hashing really need? And how many bits does the Simni comparison really need? So for the, for the Robin Hood hashing, um, since it gives us the best possible layout, um, how far is an item ever going to be removed from the ideal position? Like how, hi how high do we have to be able to count up? Um, so 16 entries, is anything ever more than 16 removed from the ideal position? And this is rare, but it does happen, so we have to support it. 32 entries, however, is a thing that basically doesn't happen. It, it, like Things are just not that far removed from the ideal position. Um, well, I write here, if your hash function is good, which again, the table can't control because that's the thing you pass in. And um, I say less than a million elements, but most tables are going to be that size, I think. Um, and it's just a choice that you make when you, like for bigger tables, you choose other, choose other hash tables. So let, 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 let's, let's see what this looks like. So. We're going to ensure that everything's at most 32 items removed from, removed from the ideal position. If this is ever not the case, like we insert and we end up at distance 33, what we do is we grow the table, rehash everything, and then hope that with more space, we don't get the same mm -hmm. problem. And if you have a bad hash function, this is really going to hurt you because you're going to waste lots of memory, but then don't have bad hash functions or use a different hash table. Well, <coughs> you said hope, but, but that's not a strategy. If, it, if in fact it does happen, you'd rehash again and you'd keep doing this until it did work, right? Yes. Right. It's not going to fail. It's just but if you had a bad enough hash table, it would <coughs> fail. That is proud of it. Yes. So the question is, the question is basically like um, that, that, that this, if, if you actually have like 32 <coughs> collisions on one single slot, then it's going to keep on growing and you're just going to like run out of memory and... It like hashes to the same slot every time. Yes. yes. It will fail. But if it's at all reasonable, eventually it'll get big enough and it works. Yes. And it, don't, you don't, it doesn't have to be that reasonable of, of, of a hash function. It just has to be like not stupid. Right. Because the, <laughs> yeah. Um, like, like the 32 distance is rare. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So then what we're going to do is we're going to have five bits for the distance, which is going to be enough to count to 32, and three bits for the hash. Um, so we lost on the hash, we lost four bits. So we're going to get more false positives. But since we now have the distance in there, we're also gaining something, which is that if it, since we're comparing the distance bits, only values that have the right distance are going to compare equal. Um, so if anything hashed to a different slot, it's going to have a dis different distance value. So what this does is it kind of separates out all the different slots because only things that are the right distance away from our slot are going to compare equal to our, in our lookup. So we, 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 we no longer have things shuffled together. And then this is the really cool part, which is that on lookup, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the first 16 elements all at once. If it's not in those, we're going to look at the next 16 elements all at once. And if it's not in those, then we know it's not in the table. Mm. <clears throat> and what this does is it gives us a guaranteed constant lookup time. And so, because um, normally in hash mm. tables, what you have, you always have a loop where you have to keep on searching until you find some condition, like a null pointer or like an empty ent entry. Yes, question. Is that true? It's true if you're looking at the very first slot in the metadata, but if you're actually looking later in the metadata, don't you have to go into the third slot just to <coughs> the overflow? The question is, what if I have like a weird offset? Don't I have to go into a third slot um, uh, sometimes? 
The answer is no, because I always start probing at exactly the en ent entry that, um, that I hash to. So I know that it's only going to be either on that or at most 32 away. Like I, I don't, I don't, I don't like. So this is actually a difference to Google's table because they start on offsets of sixteen. I do not start on offsets of sixteen on this one. Um, Just to check my understanding, at yes. most thirty-one away, right? Um, yes, actually at most thirty away because I, I, I use thirty-one to indicate empty. So that's. Um, but yes, um, this is actually only at most thirty away in this table. But I just wrote thirty-two to make it work out with the bits and didn't want to go into the details of that. Uh, Another does, question. Just to make sure what Alistair said is, to understand what he said, is that it doesn't have to be aligned. You can start at any offset with the SSE instructions to avoid the third block. The question is, the SSE instructions, don't they need alignment? Because, um, and, and the answer to that is that it used to be a big performance penalty if you, don't, if you do unaligned loads for SSE. I think that's gotten much smaller or it may even have gone away entirely now on modern CPUs. Where, um, where the unaligned loads basically don't hurt you that much anymore. At the very least, you get two cache lines some of the time, yeah? Um, double. Yes. The, the, the comment is it might, you might cross cache lines now. <coughs> anyway, so we got this nice property where we'd only have to like one lookup, two lookup, we're done, and that's, that's going to be a cool thing. So let's look at that performance. Um, here's unsuccessful lookups, and here's a new table. And it's kind of fast, but it's not like an obvious win. I'd like to point out a few things, though. First thing is over here in the left-hand side, what I do is when the table is pretty small, I actually only look at the first 16. I don't even look at the second 16. Because I know it. In, in, like, if the table is pretty small, it doesn't happen that anything is any, ever more than 16 items removed from the ideal position. And so this is like up to size 16K, I think. But then what's really nice is I just get this completely flat line, because it's one lookup, and it's never more than one lookup. Um, How do you know that? How do you know it's never more than, you actually install? I, I define it to be never more than 16. If I ever insert a value, it's more than 16. On this size, I grow the table. Okay, what, a, what happens if, does this account for removing elements or we haven't thought about that? Uh, it does account for removing elements. So for removing elements in Robin Hood hashing, you don't use tombstones, you shift things around back to um, to, to, so that everything has the invariant again. So erasing gets a little bit slower, but not much slower, actually. I'm totally fine if it's really <coughs> slow. I just wanted to know if yes. it breaks something or so all well, good. Yeah. Another question, yes. In, in these tests, do you check that you're not resizing it to the 16? Um, so um, the question is, um, do I check that I'm not resizing this? Um, I Comparing apples and oranges, right? Right, yeah. So, so the, Yes, so the question is like, what happens if in this test I accidentally have a bad hash and like it keeps on growing and it uses lots of memory and then um, I have, well, I don't have it in the slides, but what I do is I have a, a, a um, I have a version of this graph where I normalize for memory usage. So like I multiply the performance by how much memory was it using. And um, if I ever hit, hit that case, then it would have gone way up in that other graph and I didn't hit that case. Um, but also, I mean, the, these numbers, like the reason why I chose the 16 and at this cutoff is because <coughs> I, I looked at cases and like, like I mean, it, it's basically I made the choice where to cut it off based on, um, based on where it doesn't happen, that, that, the, that, the, that it's ever more than 16 removed. Yeah, second thing I'd like to point out is on this right-hand side, we've got like the higher cost, but the cost is more constant. So um, the higher cost comes from, there's a few more false positives, I think, and it's also that this table is just slightly more complicated. Because now I've got this count in there, and it just the assembly is more complicated in, in the lookup function. But I won't go into that. But we just but what's nice is we have this more constant cost where the um, where the spikes go away entirely because we only ever do two lookups. And so even if we jump into the middle of the cluster and we get all the same clusters, we know that within that cluster we get the best possible layout. So we only have to look at the current 16, next 16. <coughs> and we don't have to keep on scanning through the clusters. So this may be a nice property. Like this may be a good hash table to use if you're if you're confident in your hash function. Um, then here is successful lookups, which had um, yeah with all the old tables, and here is a new table in there. And it's basically the same speed as, as as the other flat hash map. It's slightly faster in some cases. So I think it's like a a win on average. Um, I was looking for something more though. So. And I noticed there's one really weird thing in this graph, which is um, this guy. Like, why is pointer hash map so fast? Pointer hash map was a linked list in arrays. 
because this up here is two pointer fetches, but the, the, the pointer hash map also had two pointer fetches. It had like the first array and, and the backup array. Um, and then there's a linked list behind that, so we might get many more. So um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to measure how often do we ever actually go to the backup array. Like, like how, many, how many comparisons am I doing in here? One second. Um, <coughs> so what I did is I built a pointer hash map of a million elements or just under a million elements. I made sure it's really full. It has a load factor of 93%. And then I, I wanted, I counted how far, uh, how many comparisons do I have to look at for each item in the map. So for every single item in the map, I checked how far down a linked list is it, how many comparisons would I have to do before I end up at that guy. And so I said mm -hmm. in the Robin Hood hashing, nothing is ever more than 32 removed from the ideal position. And this guy is much better. The furthest I found was nine. Like an, there was a single item that was nine items down a linked list. And then um, eight comparisons happen more often. And then there's a pattern to these where each of these happened more often than the previous one. So like three comparisons is already pretty common, which means it's not the first one. I have to follow a linked list, it's not the second one, and then the third one is the one I was looking for. But two comparisons is still much more common, and by far the most common case is one comparison. Meaning, I, I, I look at the first item in the map, and it's immediately, it's immediately what I'm looking for. So I graphed these out for you, and like if, if, you, if you show it in a graph, you just see how big the difference is. Where like number one totally dominates, and so by far the most common cases, you immediately find it. Sometimes you have to look at the second one, but like anything after that is just like rounding arrows, and it's really rare. So that's super nice. Um, I averaged this out, and it, the average number of comparisons is um, 1.46. Um, for completeness, I also did the same thing with unsuccessful lookups. And there the graph looks like this. We have a new entry on the left-hand side, which is 0, which means um, the most common case now is I look into the first slot, I find an empty slot, I don't have to do any comparisons, I'm done. And then 1 is still pretty common, so I look at the first slot, I have to compare it, it's not equal, but there's no next pointer, so I don't have to keep on walking down a linked list. <clears throat> and then two, three, four, etc. Uh, are less rare. And so here the average number of comparisons is even lower, it's 0 0.93. <coughs> so this is super nice. So we have here on our hands a hash table that, like, basic, that usually finds the right item immediately on the first lookup, um, which is a, it's just a super nice property to have. Actually, Android map has the same property, it's just hidden because it's so slow for other reasons. Um, <coughs> but so let's... Let's write a hash table that uses this, but it also like, doesn't have all the memory overhead and doesn't have all the um, other slowdowns. So here's what pointer hash map looks like with the main array where the lookups start and a second array for collisions, which are out of the way. And our problem with this table is this pointer that I have here, which these have to be full 8-byte pointers because the, um, the linked list could be anywhere in memory. Like my, my um, yeah, because the backup array could be anywhere. And like, there can actually be more than one backup array because when the first one's full, I just allocate a second one, so they could really be anywhere in memory. So the idea is to get rid of this pointer, how about we just store these um, hash collisions in the unused slots in the first table? So what we do is we literally just take the first key, put it over there, second key goes there, and the third key goes down there. So now everything is nicely densely packed, and it's just a single mm -hmm. array, but we just lost all of our nice properties, because now we, get, we no longer have this common case of zero lookups, and, like, um, and it just we now get these unrelated items mixed together and it just isn't as pretty. So what we do for that is that, um, is that we're going to indicate whether an item is the beginning of a linked list or whether it's further down, whether it's a direct hit or just used for storage. So I'm going to mark all of these with like this white color here, and uh, well, it's actually gray, but it's white. Um, and now that indicates that this is an empty, that this is what was, it was actually an empty slot. I'm just using it for storage for, as, in, as, a link, as part of a linked list for something else. But actually, n nothing ever hashed to this slot. So if I do a lookup here and like I, I, it hashes to this slot, I see that the special bit in the pointer is set, meaning this is, an empty, this is an empty bucket, and I can immediately leave again without doing any comparisons. Now, if I want to insert something here, what I have to do is I have to push this thing out of the way and then insert my value. So insertions get a little bit slower, but that's, that's going to be... Um, that's going to be fine because our lookups get so much faster. And so now we want to do the same thing with just one byte metadata per entry. Because now everything is in one array, so we shouldn't need the full pointer anymore. Okay, here's the memory layout of what we're going to do. We have 16 metadata values followed by 16 entries <coughs> in the table. So this is the layout that I said didn't work for the, for the Google hash table, but in this one it actually works really well. And then what we're going to do is we're going to use... use um, 
Our metadata is this one bit to indicate this direct hit or, um, or storage behavior. And um, we're going to do seven bits for jump distance. So we're going to build a linked list by storing jump distances throughout this table. Uh, through this table. So um, let's, let, let's just see how this works by inserting some items. So I'm going to insert an item here, and the first one just goes straight into that first slot. I'm going to write a zero for jump distance, zero meaning end of linked list. Um, if I insert something again, I have to keep on searching until I find an empty, uh, until I find an empty slot, which uh, when I insert that, I write a one for the jump distance in the other one, and in this empty slot, I, I set the special bit, meaning it's just used for storage. So if I insert something into that slot, I can, I can push this guy out of the way, and then insert my new value in here. Um, I'm going to do one more lookup just to illustrate that when I, when I insert something here, I have to walk down the linked list, find an <laughs> empty slot, and then build myself a linked list that just first jumps two, then jumps one, and then it's the end of linked list. And finally, if I insert something here, I can easily jump into the next block of data it's just by using jump distance three. This is just to indicate that there's, there's nothing special about these blocks. It's just for storage, but I can just jump between them um, using jump distances. There's, there's one open problem with this table, which is that um, we only have seven <coughs> bits for the jump distance. So if we ever have um, 128 items in a row all filled up, then we can never jump out of that block. And so that's, gonna, um, that, 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 that's, that's not a good thing. So the solution for that is to um, add a level of indirection, which is going to be these numbers. So now the jump distances <laughs> are not a jump distance directly, but they're an index into this table. And these numbers, they have some patterns to them, like these are triangular numbers, which have some nice properties related to powers of two, but that's not that important. What's important is that um, I have down here some really large numbers, and um, with those I can find jump distances of like a million or more, so no matter how big of a cluster I have, I can always jump out of it. And so that's, that's going to allow me to, um, to store arbitrary jump distance, or like pretty large jump distances, just using seven bits. Okay, let's look at the performance of that. So here's unsuccessful <coughs> lookups, and here's the new table in that. And it's pretty fast, but it doesn't beat Google's flat hash map. But if I'd never seen Google's flat hash map before, I would have told you this is amazing, because it's the fastest thing I've seen. Um, but it's still, like, it, 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 it does really well compared to all the other tables. <coughs> and, um, and, yeah, and so, so I like this behavior, um, because also it, it's, more, it, it's, more, it's slightly more stable. It doesn't have the same spikiness. For successful lookups, the graphs looks like, looked like this before, and here's a new table. I mean, clearly it beats Google's hash table for successful lookups, because we no longer have the second pointer fetch on average. But what's really, what's really cool is that um, we're almost as fast as the Robin Hood hashing, but we have a much higher max load factor. The max load factor on this is 93.75%, which is a round number in base 2. It's just a weird number in base 10. But it's, it's a very high max load factor, and it's, it, it doesn't slow down by that too much. So this table is like pretty stable for high load factors. So this is actually my new favorite hash table um, because it's, it's pretty fast for both cases. It's not the fastest in either. But all the other tables had like, oh, I'm fast here, but I'm slow there. Or I'm fast here, but slow there. And this one's really fast in both. Um, let me summarize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's very fast for both, has low memory overhead. And it's, um, it's got the stable performance, where stable performance means one, it can sustain high load factors without, without slowing down, or without slowing down too much. And the second thing is um, it has fewer performance pitfalls, where this is a bit of a um, point that I won't go into too much, but there's a thing where every single hash table I could insert, um, I can insert a patterns of values that would really slow down every uh, hash table. Like, like for dense hash map, for, exa for example, it's just sequential numbers, and then it goes really slow. But like this guy, or there's a thing about bad patterns of insertion where chaining hash tables don't have fewer of those bad patterns of insertion. And this one gets all the same benefit from those other chaining hash tables where it just has fewer performance pitfalls. So it's more stable on average, and you're less likely to hit really bad cases. So that's actually, let's review what we did. Uh, we started off with an unordered map. We improved that by using powers of two. Improved that further by going by having uh, by using one array. Then we did this um, compact linked list, which had some really nice properties, and it ended up being surprisingly fast. Then we went to Robin Hood hashing. Um, we slowed down again in order to save some memory. We improved that a tiny bit by using Robin Hood hashing again, 
And then we uh, build this new hash table, which is my new favorite hash table. Cool. Um, <coughs> to end, I'd like to give some recommendations for what table to use in what situation. And I'm going to build a decision tree here that uh, you can follow through to see what table is the best table in your case. Mm. But if you don't want a decision tree and just like a simple good <laughs> default choice, I'm actually going to recommend Google's table. Um, and the reason for that is that, well, they haven't released it yet, but when they do, it'll have like the, um, it'll have been well tested by Google and, and, and have like, it'll be a, a solid good table. And this new thing is just a little bit too young. It's just like less than a month old. And if you ask me again in six months, I will tell you, you should use this one. But so far I haven't even used it myself widely. I mean, I've run all kinds of benchmarks and I'm confident it's gonna be really good. <coughs> but it's like, you know how it is when like things are really young. So at this point, just use um, a Google's flat hash map if you don't wanna think too much. If you have a specific case, then we're gonna build a decision tree. First question is, do you need this reference stability property? And if the answer is yes or you don't know, you might not know because maybe people are taking pointers and passing them around and you don't know the lifetimes of the pointers of items into your map, then use my unordered map because it's a good implementation of unordered map. Otherwise, we're gonna to go to the next slide, which is most of your lookups are, if they're unsuccessful, you wanna use Google's hash table because they've got amazing performance there. If they're successful or mixed, then we go to the question of, do you do more insertions than lookups? I didn't talk about insertions at all, but the intuition is that, um, well, if the answer is yes for this, you also wanna use Google's flat hash map. And the reason for that is that insertions are, they're dominated by unsuccessful lookups because an insertion is an unsuccessful lookup followed by some changes. And usually the first part of that is the slow part. And so since Google's flat hash map is really fast for uh, unsuccessful lookups, it's also really fast for insertions. But this is a pretty rare use case, so let's say no. And then the question is, do you care about memory? To which there can be two answers, either yes or I guess, and who doesn't? So if you really care, you wanna use byte hash map. If you somewhat care, then you can use the Robin Hood hashing version because it's actually not crazy overhead and it's, it's a really fast uh, hash table. <coughs> and if you walk through this decision tree, I think the most common answers would be you don't care about reference stabili stability. Most of your lookups are successful or mixed. You uh, don't do more insertions and lookups and you do care about memory usage. So I think the long-term byte hash map will be <laughs> my, my most common recommendation. Good, last slide. Is this as fast as it gets? Um, of course not. Uh, the, uh, there's a few reasons for that. I mean, I think I can improve byte hash map a little bit more because I just have some, some ideas left over. But there's also a more social reason for this, which is that um, hash tables and much of the SDL really suffer from not having standardized benchmarks. And I wanna illustrate this with a quote from uh, John Carmack, where he gave a talk about invention and innovation. And he said this, he said, um, having the ability to score what you're doing is really important. So many of the advances in computer vision and machine learning have been as a result of this. It used to be that you would have the three or four images that you would try, out, try your technique out on. Maybe you would be able to compare against <coughs> somebody else, but rarely rigorously. Nowadays, you have these massive data sets and they have yearly competitions and the pace of innovation has been really breathtaking. And I think hash tables are still in that first phase where you have like your three or four benchmarks that you run your hash table on and maybe you compare against somebody else, but really rigorously. And it just doesn't like, it takes a long time to get a really re good results in that. If we, on the other hand, if we had like big data sets where like with real world use cases where you can measure your hash table on, and if we had yearly competitions for who has the best STL implementation, then you bet these things will get a lot faster very quickly. I don't have anything to announce on that other than that I'm gonna open source my benchmarks and my, my hash tables obviously, but um, I think it takes more than that. And I, I don't have anything right now other than to point out the problem. Um, and that's the end of my talk and thanks for listening. Uh, yes, right here. Well, I noticed that the, the benchmarks are all on, on, on fixed size data, not, not handle body types. And yes. one of the concerns that I have is, is when you're talking about something that does have a separate location and you start to do things with, with the, these nodes, the nice thing about this is it doesn't really need to worry about allocators because it's one block. Yes. But when it's no longer one block and the data itself, the pieces that you're putting in, mm -hmm. have a separate part, uh, what do you do? And <coughs> would allocators being part of this be a good thing or a bad thing? Um, so the question is about what do you do when the... Um, when, when you, when in, your, in, your, in your hash table, you just store a pointer to some other data. And like, could you use allocators to somehow pack that tighter together to get nicer behavior? Um, 
The answer is I think you would want a different hash table for that. You might want to write a hash table just for that use case. I don't know what that would look like. I mean, this one, <coughs> um, like the thing about these is like the, the these, um, since it's all in one big array, um, even if you were to put your other data at the end of that array like and just have it um, right next to it, you would still get a second point of pattern. It wouldn't actually help you that much because this is what the Google's hash table did and they, they just put it right next to each other in one single allocation. But they're still far enough away where like they're in separate cache lines and it just doesn't, um, I don't think you would gain, any, gain anything from that if, if you were to put it close together because. So to just say what you said back. Yes. If, if I have a data, it's not that I want to rewrite the hash table, I want yes. to rewrite the data type so that all of the data is contained in itself, much like the short string optimization. So the question is um, whether you want to, whether you want to put all the data into your, into your hash table to like have the, the same, like a small string optimization. Um, well, the answer is you have to measure it. Um, the, the, um, <coughs> so, some of these tables are like some of these tables really slow down when the data size gets too big. Um, I mean, dense hash map is the worst of those, where like every byte you add slows it down a little bit. But um, others are more resistant to that. And I, I have all the benchmarks somewhere, but I don't remember right now which one is the most robust to bigger data sizes, and like whether you want to insert just big chunks into your into your value. I think this last one's going to be pretty good because it uses the linked list and. Um, and that's usually a good property for if you have big values, but I measure it is the answer. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's a less common use case, but does this apply equally well to multi maps and multi sets? <coughs> the question is about uh, multi map and, and multi set. Um, I don't support those actually because I don't know why you would want a multi map hash table. Because what happens is, I mean, when, when you do that, you get the worst case because now everything hashes to the same slot. So you get this really long linked list, right? Because like multi-map by definition, things hash to the same slot. And um, I haven't done the benchmark on that, but I wouldn't be surprised if the, if the standard multi-map would actually be faster than hash tables there. Um, simply because you're literally creating the worst data for hash tables when you use a multi-map. Well, I mean, it depends on how many. If you only have, have like two values in there, then maybe that's doable, but I don't even support it because I don't, I don't know when you would want to, honestly. Yes. Uh, anyway, yes. No, no, you. Yes. Um, so <coughs> this is a very elementary question. Going back to your first collapse diagram, um, you, the very first time when you made yes. it, I didn't quite understand how that works because you, when you get a collision with, you've got several things in your first hash, yes. and then you get a collision with a new thing, mm -hmm. where does that go? So the question is about the very first, uh, about, about the about the very first um, graph with the dense hash map, where like yeah. I just put all the point, I just put all the values straight into one array, yeah. and what to do on collisions. And the answer to that is that there's whole books about that topic. And what dense hash map does is it um, <coughs> it does a thing called quadratic probing, which means the first, like if on the first collision it just goes one item down, the second one it goes three items, then it goes six items, then it goes eleven, and it grows at a it grows at a like it. it this, yeah, it grows at, at an almost quadratic rate. Uh, like, and like it, it keeps on jumping further and further. And the reason for that is that then you don't get, um, you, you don't get as much clustering in that table. Does that answer your question, someone? Um, <coughs> but if there, um, no, I, I guess I still don't understand how it works. Because when you go to look up, yes. your hash takes you to a spot. And then you yes. have to look through the possibilities. And you do a linear search. You do a linear search. No, no, you don't do a linear search. You do, or like, or you use. Oh, it's a link. No, it's not a linked list, but you just follow a specific pattern of jumps that you do. And that, that pattern is well described. It's, it's just like the first <coughs> jump is one down. The second jump is, is another three down. The next jump is another six down. And as long as you always follow the same pattern, you're always going to arrive at the same slots and you're going to get the same results and you find your key that way. Do you end up using that pattern then or do you use linear probing? <coughs> so I do I... You did so many hash maps, I guess you can't answer the question. Yes, the, answer, the question is, do I use that pattern? So I, 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 um, for Robin Hood hashing, you cannot use that pattern because it gets too complicated to, to figure out the distances. Um, for In this last map, I actually do use that pattern. So what I, let me see if I can, um, what I had, I had, um, da, 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 nope, 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 it's too far back. 
Let me see if I can find it. This guy. These numbers, I mean, okay, the first numbers are just like 0 to 16 because I want to encourage things to stay close together. But then after that, I use the same pattern that dense hash map uses, which is, um, these are called triangular numbers. And then they have, like, what they do is, A, they grow kind of fast, and so you get, like, big distances. And the other thing that they do is that they have this really nice property where if you use them on a table that's power of two size and you follow these jumps, you're going to get a permutation through your table where you never... <clears throat> you always arrive at a different, like any anytime you wrap around, you arrive at a different slot and you arrive at a different pattern through your table. So you're guaranteed to not end, at, at, end up at the same slot again after wrapping around when you get to the end. And then down here I have a different pattern again, which is just triangular numbers, but really big ones. So I can always do far jumps just, just for that case. Yes? So if, if you access the table, is it always going to be in cache? Have you considered this that using some sort of pure function to compute uh, pure jump distance instead of going through the table? <clears throat> the question is whether whether it's worth it doing a lookup into this into this array or whether I want to compute it um, directly. So you can actually compute these triangular num numbers very quickly, which is one other thing why they're so nice. Um, the problem with that is that um, if I go up to the so if if I let's say I want to I, I'm just using the calculation for tri triangular numbers, then what I um, I can only go up to the 128th triangular number and that doesn't give me these really big numbers, which I sometimes need to jump out of clusters. And so I, because um, I think that 128 triangular number is somewhere around like 16K or so. And like in these benchmarks, when I have really big tables, like of millions of entries, you definitely get the case where, all, where 16K items in a row are full. Then, then you, need to, you need to be able to jump further than that. So I, I, um, I couldn't use that calculation. And I, I'm not sure if it would be faster because I mean, this thing is a constant that's shared between all hash tables ever, so it's probably going to be, at least if you're using a table repeatedly, it's going to be in cache. Next question, yes. Um, have you uh, tried to implement the parallel versions of these hash maps? Uh, you mean like for multi-threading purposes? Or? Yes. Have I tried implementing parallel versions? I have not. Um, okay. it's, 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 yeah, it's one of those things where you just say, put a mutex around the container. Like it's, it's, it's what the STL does, right? A good, a good suggestion for it then mm. is to try and break it up uh, into sections and stripe uh, your, your mutexes. So you basically treat it as if you've got like N uh, tables. Yes, so the comment is that if you build the multi-threading into the table, you can do some really clever things and you can, because um, you don't have to lock the whole table. You may only have to lock like a small section of the table when you do a lookup. Uh, and, uh, also, you. Like if you had 16 tables, then yes. your growth patterns are not power of two, but they're un like they only grow one sixteenth of the number of two. Like each one's growing a power of two. But yeah, yeah I can't quite visualize that right now in my head. We'd have to talk about it after. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <coughs> yes. Yes. Next question. Just a follow on to my earlier question. So, if um, your hash function is such, which it would be, right, that you're you're using all hash values. Yes. It, if you get uh, collisions, you're going to have it's not going to work well, right? Because every one is going to collide and get bumped. <coughs> and um, I'm not sure. I I'm not sure I understand the question. So you mean like, if if you, if you like, um, I mean, hash collisions are handled kind of naturally because you just walk down the linked list, or like because that, that's what all these were, or what what do you mean with like if the you would get hash collisions and you would just get keep on getting collisions. Perhaps I'm not understanding it, but if, if, you, if, you, if you need to have, if you have a, a if, if one hash uh, result has two numbers, you know, two results, yes. then you're using up another position, which is also going to have two results. They're all going <coughs> to, so where do they all go? Yes, so, okay, so the question is, um, Yes, because if, if, I, if I put my thing out of the way of the first, like I have, to, I have a hash collision, I have to put it somewhere else. Yeah. Um, what I did for that is I just used the, all, the, all the empty slots, right? So I, I just use slots that are already empty. Yeah. And now if a new value wants to be inserted there, the first thing I do is I move the old thing out of the way. Um, okay. So I, 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 I have these linked lists self-contained, so they never, they never um, mix together. They, 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 always, they always stay completely separate, like it did. Yeah, it, it, you, you, can, you can never end up with a case where you have to keep on looping down linked lists forever or something. It doesn't happen. Yes, please. So 
you compare a number of approaches, I didn't see any comparison. Maybe your benchmarks aren't very amenable to it, I don't know, but I didn't see any comparison to any approaches of dealing with uh, uh, collisions by using multiple hash functions. Right. I wonder if you have any thoughts about how that fits into all yes. the benchmarking you were doing. Excellent question. Multiple hash functions. Um, I So I measured a few other tables. I actually never measured one that has multiple hash functions. And, and the reason for that is that um, it just seems like a, well, I should have actually measured one. That's a good, I, I, I don't know if that's a good one, but um, it, it, the, the, the problem with that one is you're putting, um, you're putting more code on the critical path where like um, you now have to do like the second hashing thing. And it, it's just a, it's a more expensive way to resolve collisions where these all are like are really cheap ways to resolve collisions. And um, the, the second hash function, you usually want to use it, like, like John here said earlier, for like the open addressing, because there um, um, you want to be able to jump somewhere else entirely. But with these linked lists, you get, you get few collisions anyways, because things don't mix together so much. So I'm not sure if the second hash function, I, I, don't, I don't think that would help. Like one thing I did measure for this, which, is, is called, which I didn't mention in the talk at all, is hopscotch hashing, which is a similar, like, which is also a, a similarly clever approach for like, um, for knowing immediately like where to look, and it's it's it's, um, and you usually just have the same problem where you, if you're putting more things on your critical path, it just slows down. It just puts it moves, it moves your whole table up a little bit. Like every everything every single benchmark just moves up a little bit, and and so I. I don't believe in those. Or I, I I need to I I I shouldn't say it because I haven't measured it, but I it. Intuitively, I don't expect it to be um, to be better than 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 um, these ta these tables. Yes. So one of the things that's really really hard is to do benchmarks where the the measurement is a fair measurement in the context of a running program. Sure, a micro benchmark will give you yes. certain results because everything's in cache. Yes. But one of the things that was very challenging for me when I was trying to benchmark allocators over a long run of the program is yes. like, how do you do that without having like a billion lines of code? Yes. And so what was your general technique for benchmarking here? So what was the question is like, yeah, it's really difficult to benchmark and these micro benchmarks, how much do they really say? Actually, I want to say one thing about the Google talk is that they have a really cool measure, which is they, they have this graph where they can show over time um, well, I had the graph for memory usage, where like memory usage went down over time, over the month. They have a similar graph where they can see that CPU usage goes down over time from when they switch to different hash tables. Um, I don't have anything like that, so what I do is I have um, I have way too many benchmarks and a whole battery of different benchmarks with like different um, patterns of insertion and different like um, different uh, different keys, and then I have benchmarks where I like insert a bunch, erase a bunch, and then do lookups and you just hope that um, that you get the right things, and like, what tends to happen is that um, is that well, this last table is actually going to be really good in all of the is, is, is really good in all of the benchmarks. It, 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 it's um, and it's 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 usually only when you hit a really bad case for a table. Like what tends to happen is they look the same in most benchmarks, and then in the real world you just have to just have to benchmark it again when you finally start using it in your code. So. So what I was going to suggest is, yeah. in a more realistic scenario, not that this isn't extremely valuable, yeah. but to validate it, you do your micro benchmark, and then you try to say, okay, I'm using this hash table, but as we all know, the, the, the programs do other things besides look up in hash tables. Yes. So if you could interleave somehow with some other work and say, yes. okay, let me compare hash <coughs> tables in the presence of other uses of the cache line, yes. that would give you an indication of, in practice, Yes. How much better is this? And again, it's this is not easy. This is like mind-bendingly hard. Yes. But that would be a suggestion to demonstrate across in in a real-world scenario. Yes. So for the microphone, it was about how to make a better benchmark, and I actually would really like to have better benchmarks because I found out new things about benchmarking even just by preparing this talk, and like it's still an evolving field of just how do you even benchmark hash tables. I used to have a whole section in this talk just about how do you even write benchmarks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had I cut it because it was kind of a big detour that didn't lead anywhere, but um, it's um, yeah. It, it, if there was standardized benchmarks, it would like then that, that's that's the thing I, I said at the end. That's what I want. If there was like some set of things that people could agree on, and then we could improve those benchmarks over time as like new information came in. That would be really cool.
That would be a really cool thing. Yes, please. Or maybe a suggestion on the same thing. If we had some ideas on how to use hash maps <coughs> in the real world, yeah. and like on memory allocators, for example, the, the thing I always would do is you would take the you you just take the patterns of allocs and trees or something yeah. <coughs> something like Chrome, and then you know run over that data over and over again yeah. or something. If you can get some real real allocate like a hash map usage patterns out of the real world, then you can apply. Yes. It to yeah, the comment is you could record a bunch of allocations and freeze and hash map lookups from a real world program yeah. and then replay that to, yeah. to, to, to do your benchmark, which I would really like that if you have that. Um, Just as an advertisement for how hard allocators are to prove that they're useful, if you do a micro benchmark in an allocator, then the global allocator acts like a local allocator. There's no benefit, almost, that's not quite true. And everybody says, see, ah. they don't do anything. Great. Yeah. <coughs> Yeah, for the microphone, there's discussion about benchmarks and how how and to how to trick it. Yes, yes. Cool. Um, actually, if you have, we have like five minutes left. So I'm actually going to show you the the trick for doing faster integer inter inter modulos because oh, yeah. it's a kind of cool thing. Uh, let me go back to the end. <coughs> da, 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 all this stuff. Nope, it's not as fast as it gets. The code is not online yet, but I make it online soon. Uh, oh, this this one, which is there's a standard benchmark that people sometimes use, but nobody asked about it, so I skip over it. Actually, what's interesting about this guy is um, so the order is roughly what you would expect, except Google's Flat 16 is really bad. But the fastest one in this guy is uh, analog map, <laughs> and the reason why analog map is the fastest is because this benchmark is all the way on the left of my graphs, where like you usually have pretty small cases. And another map has a really small inner loop. It's just point of fetch compare, point of fetch compare, point of fetch compare. And so um, when everything's in cache, it's going to be pretty cheap. And so it's the fastest thing. And Google's table does really badly here because it's actually a bit of a weird benchmark for hash tables because the, um, the seven bits of the hash are completely useless. Because what happens is the, um, the, the hash table or the, the, the benchmark here, this one is the, the more standardized benchmark the values just go from like 0 to 16 or like 0 to 256 or something. So it's like it fits in a very small range. And it, it, you don't even need a hash function for that normally. You just use an array. So it doesn't even have all the bits set in the hash. It's kind of weird. Anyway, so um, powers of 2, I don't have to not, I maybe I have to motivate this, I don't know. But like <laughs> um, there's all kinds of problems with powers of 2. Like if you have pointers and they're uh, 8 or 16 byte aligns, then the lower bits are useless. And you don't, don't just want to chop them, chop off the top upper bits. There's also this problem where like, um, Oftentimes, your IDs are actually combinations of different information. Um, this is a very common thing I see. And then um, is if what happens is, is you have different information in your IDs like all together into the different bits. Well, then the power of two is really slow. And I won't go into this too much because I want to get to the cool part. And there's two minutes remaining. Um, so um, yeah, you want, your table has to be a prime number because then you guarantee to use all the bits because it's got nice properties, uh, prime numbers do. So here's the first way to make it faster. And this is from, um, from boost multi-index. So what you do is you store, instead of storing the, the, the instead of, um, you store the, you make sure, like this is a very long list. It goes on for quite a while. And, and you, you say your table is always going to be one of these prime numbers. You just have a long list of prime numbers and you say your table is always one of these. And then you store the index into that table and you do a giant switch case statement. And every one of these is, is a constant, um, is, a, is a modulo by constant. And your compiler will turn this into magic assembly that doesn't actually do a modulo, and you end up much faster. <coughs> um, there's a way to improve on this. Like this one is in, used in Boost Multi-Index. To improve this, you just you do this, where you have function pointers. Now, instead of storing the prime index, you store the function pointer. It's all the same numbers otherwise, and it's all the same code. The reason why this one's faster is because the previous one doesn't get inlined into your find function. So you have to do a function call anyways. <coughs> then you have to have the function call followed by a switch, followed by a bunch of code. And this one is just like you're saving the switch statement. So you just store the function pointers. But otherwise, it's the same thing. Just have a lot of function pointers. And if you look at these for a while and you look at a lot of these, then what you find is that um, they all have the same pattern at some point. Like they, 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 it generates the same assembly over and over again. Um, and so there's this library called libdivide, which, um, which does fast integer, integer division. And it does division, but if you have division, you can like construct a modulo from that. You just divide, then multiply, then subtract. And um, so I measured these three things against each other. 
So I've got at the top the switch prime mod version, and here the function pointer prime is in red underneath, and lib divide is the green one, and, and power of two is at the bottom. And lib divide is the fastest, um, but I actually don't ship with lib divide by default. And the reason for that is that lib divide adds a bunch of code to your find function, and now your find function sometimes doesn't get inlined anymore, and then you're much slower and you lose all your get benefits. So I ship with the function pointer prime version by default because the function pointer doesn't bloat your find function too much, so your find still gets inlined, and then, then you still get this nice fast behavior. And this is much, all of these, I, didn't, I don't even have the normal integer modulo, but it would be way up there somewhere. So this is a cool way to make integer modulo faster. And I still want to see if I can find somewhere to use this lib divide. It's just, I had some benchmarks where they suddenly got much slower because the find function no longer gets, gets inlined because you've got too much code in there. So I didn't use that. Cool, that's actually the end now. Right. <laughs>